sadness, and I didn't know. And um, I get home, and, and in our house, my room was in the way in the back of the house. It was actually private, you know, which wasn't good if you're a sinner, you know. <laughs> With sliding glass doors, you know, so that's no good. That's no good. <laughs> Imagination's running wild everywhere. Man. So I, 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 uh, I get home, house is pitch black. And I start, I, I remember putting my hand, uh, uh, opening the front door. And I started walking. And it seemed, church, I'll tell you something. I know I'm being dramatic, but I, this is how it was to me. Yeah, I remember it as if it was yesterday. And every step seemed like a, like a long, like I was walking in mud. And I walk in and walk into the back of the house. And I got to my door. And I put my hand on my doorknob. And I walked in. And when I walked, I dropped to my knees. And I began weeping. I began crying like I've never cried in my whole life. Like I've never, I mean, when the Bible talks about weeping, that using that word weeping, I didn't know what that meant. But now I knew it. It was it was every fiber of my being and I was crying crying and I couldn't even breathe I was crying so hard and all of a sudden when I was able to catch a breath I looked up and I says God I said I tried everything in my life to make me happy and I says today I give you my life and when I said that I'm talking about a, a carnal person it was as if somebody stood over me. The best way to describe it is as if someone, as I was on my knees crying, someone stood over me with a big jar of, of warm honey and began to pour it from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I knew that the presence of the Lord was, was in my room. I felt God. And I didn't know what to do. I only knew to do three things. Here it was. I knew I needed to find a church. I knew I needed to start reading the Bible, and I knew I needed to stop stealing, because I was a good thief. Sorry to tell you, I was. I said, I knew I needed to stop. I, I didn't know anything. It was the Holy Spirit who told me, find a good church. Start reading the Word. That's what happened to me. So within two weeks, I was at my, cousin's, my cousin Sean's wedding, and a, and a, and a guy uh, that I met at the wedding, he, we just started talking. I went outside to just, you know, take a breather. We were just sitting outside. He was outside, and he's like, hey, what's up? Oh, you're, you're Sean's cousin. And I said, yeah, and everything. And um, he said, listen, he goes, um, he goes, I see that you have a heart for God. He says, I'm backslidden. He goes, I'm not serving the Lord right now because I got hurt in church. He says, but you know what? I want to get back with God. He goes, what do you, what do you say we both help each other? To get back with the Lord. We became accountable. We became accountable to one another. And I will tell you that God began to use me. And God began to just draw me closer to himself. And, and I found, we found a church together. We started visiting churches. And we were in this one church. And I, we knew that this was the place that God had for us. And in that church, where my pastor in, in, in Florida, he was the youth pastor at this place. And so I got it. My first ministry was working with children. I used to hold two and a half year old kids and singing, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, you know. And I mean, I know all about animal crackers and apple juice and I know the whole thing. I know all the stories. I know how to tell them, you know, and, and talking to them. And I mean, and it's funny because now the, some of these kids I used to hold in my arms, they're like this big, you know. They say, hey, what's up, Pastor? <laughs> you know, like, oh, I used to hold you, you know, and, and everything. And, you know, got involved in youth ministry. Here's a funny thing. You know, my wife was actually the first person I met at the youth ministry. She was the greeter at the door, and she instantly fell in love with me. No, I'm just kidding. I just said, that's not true. That's not true. She had her eyes on some, some blonde guy with blue eyes and stuff. I was like, come on, man. You know, You're kidding me. We, you know, we, we, you know, we knew each other in youth ministry, and she was at Oral Roberts University. She went to Oral Roberts University, and, um, and God just began to deal with me. And, and God, you know, God actually showed me that Joanne was my wife. 
and we were serving in youth, and she was actually at ORU. We were just friends, and I remember she came in and, and everything, and, and I was just like, bing, you know, just, you know, and we started talking, and you know what's so funny? She tried to play hard to get with me one time. She, we were at some kind of thing, and I was like, you know, like getting close to her and stuff. Because I'm, and listen, I made a commitment when I when I gave my heart to the Lord. I said, Lord, I will not date around. I will wait for the one that you have for me. Listen, listen, somebody, this is gonna help somebody. You know, some of you feel like you need to, like, you know, Baskin Robbins. Let me just see what's going on over here with all the different flavors, and see, you know, see if it's one of these, you know, you know. Listen, you trust God, God will send you the person, you know, hallelujah, yeah, that one's free, that one's free right there, all right, you know, <laughs> you can either have Boaz or Bozo, you know, <laughs> you have one of the two, one of the two, I'm sure women, go for Boaz, don't go for Bozo, so, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, <laughs> You gonna write that one down? Yeah, you can use that one too. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't make that one up. So anyway, you know. So anyway. yeah, you that one you can use again. Listen. So you know, we 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 got together and uh, and 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 my pastor went to go take. Uh, he went to go start the church in Boca Raton. We were in another city. He went to go start the church in Boca, and um, um, he said that you know I feel like you're the one that's supposed to take the church. You're the, you're the you're the you're the guy, and I became the youth pastor. Uh, our first service, uh, we, I was only, I was just dating Joanne, and uh, I was a, I was the youth pastor. We had 70, 71 kids in our in our youth ministry, and within the first year, with, we got married one year later, and within one year, we had over two hundred teenagers coming on Wednesday nights. High schoolers, not middle schoolers, high schoolers coming on Wednesday nights, and God just would be, would, would begin to move and. Uh, you know, and God blessed that youth ministry. We, we built it on two things, uh, uh, re really three. We built it on first prayer. We started these. The streets and at the schools. And third was, is that we would call people every Tuesday night. We would call people and just say, hey, do you need prayer for anything? Want, inviting them to the service the next day. That's how we built the youth ministry, tripled in, in one year. And, um, you know, and so at the church where I was, the youth ministry was like the happening thing. It was exploding. And um, uh, one time I was listening uh, on, and this is very important for you guys to know this, and I have shared this with the, with the elders, with the board, and, and just what I'm about to share with you, because it really helped uh, define me, uh, even though I wouldn't want anyone to go through what I went through, the pain that I went through, but um, I was watching television, and I heard a preacher say, he said, he goes, most pastors, he goes, they want to pray for 10 minutes, and they want revival. He goes, they don't want to do what the early church did. And they prayed for 10 days in an upper room and, and, and calling upon the promise of the Lord. And I took that to heart. And I says, man, and I got all my leaders together. I got all, you know, I used to have over 50-something youth leaders. I called them all. I said, I need you to come to the church. And I said, listen, we're going to pray. We're going to pray and fast. And we're going to seek the Lord. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna believe for revival to happen in our youth ministry. And I'm like, awesome. Okay. So the first day, I said, here's what we're going to do. This was the plan. We would pray from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. We'd come to the youth center. I'm talking about teenagers. I'm not talking about adults. I'm talking about 6 to 7 a.m. we would pray together. And then after 7, they would go to their schools, and, and they would evangelize in their schools. So the first day was me, my wife, my armor bearer, and one other leader girl. Day two was those four plus one of my other leaders, which was the sister of this one girl. And then this guy, Richie, came. And day three was like, I think like we had like 10 people. But let me tell you something, church. By day four, when I literally would unlock the door to the youth center and I would walk in, I would feel the glory of the Lord. I would feel God's presence instantly. 
Just like that. I would just open the door, and I felt what we were praying for. And all of a sudden, day five, day six, parents were dropping off their kids, dropping them off early in the morning. And we would just, like, you know, you know how, like, you know, uh, 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 sometimes you start praying and then you play the song. You got to get everybody worked up, you know, and we got to get into the spirit. I'm telling you, we would open the door and kids would just start, Jesus, and they would just start calling upon God. It was instant, just like that. So, you know, one of these days, this guy from the church says, Pastor Irwin, I need you to help my son. He's back on drugs. And I says, brother, let me tell you something. You bring him to the 6 a.m. prayer. You tell him to come to the 6 a.m. prayer. God is going to, he's going to get delivered. God's going to change his life. He said, I'll do that. So the next day, I see the guy. I said, man, I'm so glad you're here. Man, kids are already praying up a storm and everything. And, but I see the father and the father's there. And I says, hey, man, what are you doing here? Because this is really for youth. And he goes, he wouldn't come unless I came. And I was like, okay. So all of a sudden, church, let me just tell you this. Two days later, I get called. No, a day later, I get called into the pastor's office. Yeah, we heard that you were trying to start a church in the mornings. Here's what the problem was. The guy who came that brought his son was the largest giver of the church. Sad. The pastor told me, he goes, I want you to immediately stop all prayer services. Stop it all. Shut it down right now. And he goes, not only that, he goes, in your youth services, I don't want you praying for anybody. He goes, you just teach the word and that's it. I don't want you to pray for anyone. Let me tell you something, church. I dedicated my life to that place, and I couldn't understand. I had to go to my leaders and say, and they would ask me, why, why, are they, why can we not have services? Let me tell you something. I did cover my pastor. I didn't go and, and say this, that, and the other. I was too ignorant. I was too young and ignorant to know really what was going on. And I said, I said uh, listen, we just, we just have to stop. And one of my leaders said, first they took prayer out of the schools. Now they're going to take it out of the church? And... Uh, not to drag out the story, but within, within four months, and trust me, for me, it was a slow death. Within four months, all of a sudden, this guy shows up, and the pastor says, hey, listen, can you let him preach? Let him preach. And then all of a sudden, a uh, month later, the pastor says, well, listen, you know, I feel like your time is up. And I'm, let me tell you, I love these, these kids. I mean, I would die for those kids. I loved them so much. And uh, he says, yeah, he goes, this is the way we're going to do it. In September, this is September of 2000, he says, he says you're going to preach three times, he'll preach once. The next month in October, you preach twice, he preaches twice. In November, you preach once, he preaches three times, and by December, he's got it. I says, I mean, you talk about ripping my heart out of me. I mean, I would cry, and I just didn't know what was going on. And I was young. I was I was, I, I was 20, I mean, I was maybe 28 or something like that, 29 years old. I didn't know. I was just too ignorant to know what was going on underneath me, you know. And, um, and I said, well, Pastor, what am I going to do? And he's like, well, he goes, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll pray about something, you know. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I just love my youth. And, um, the door, the, you know, that door was closed and... Um, I, I, uh, an evangelist friend of mine, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to say the name, but just a large ministry, uh, you know, uh, that had been wanting me to come work for them. I showed up at a crusade and I told him, I, I, I said, hey, listen, I'm not a youth pastor anymore. And he goes, you're hired just like that. And, uh, but my heart was with my kids. And um, so did that for a while, did a youth facility at another place, at this, uh, at this other place, the pastor uh, was, uh, was very good when it came to leadership. I learned a lot about leadership, but they would not let the presence of the Lord move in the service. They, the, the minute, I mean, if, just like what we had, if, if, the, if the Lord is moving, that was, the pastor would be just like, okay, amen, let's all sit down and just cut it just like that. And I don't know about you, but man, that's like, you know, for me, I can't stand that, you know. I mean, if I don't get to preach, it's going to be a good Sunday because that means God's moving in, you know, in the worship. There's going to be times you're going to hear me not preach. 
because the Lord is moving. Now, don't say amen about me not preaching, but just say amen, you know. Just make sure you say amen because the spirit of the Lord is moving, not because, yeah, sh- shut that brother up, you know. <laughs> Listen, and so, you know, that was just, that was like a slow death and uh, just went, went from there, uh, went, moved back to Fort Lauderdale, the Fort Lauderdale area, regrouping with my wife just to regroup and just because, you know, because I was never healed from what that pastor did to me. I was never healed. And unfortunately, things came out later on where other people came to me, it's a shame what he did to you. It's a sh-. Like, I was like, well, what did he do, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and it was, all, it was all a setup. It was all because of insecurities, a spirit of control, you know? Listen, church, I'm not perfect, but there's one thing we're not gonna allow in here is a spirit of control. We're not gonna allow that, you know, you know, that, you know, I, I, listen, I, I believe in protecting the sheep, but you know what? What you do with your life and the decisions that you make, I'm here to guide you and help you. I'm not here to control you. You want to go somewhere else? God, I mean, I'm going to bless you. I can't control what you do. But if you ask my opinion, well, that's a different story. I'm going to tell you straight up, you know, what my opinion is about something. Here's a newsflash. Don't ask me something if you really don't want to know the truth. You know, no, it's true. No, don't say amen because it's really not that much of an amen. Because, I mean, if you, if you ask me if your hair looks good and it doesn't look good, I'll be like, you know, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm just like that. I mean, I just, you know, my, I, trust me, I get kicked under the table a whole bunch of times, you know. So don't ask me if that color looks good on you if you really don't want to know. But if you do want to know, you know, no, I just, I'm just telling you. I mean. <laughs> That's a nice suit, Minister Stanley. You look good. You look good. <laughs> you look very good, sir. You look very good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Um, <laughs> you guys don't mind me sharing this, do you like to know? Okay. Yeah, I just, yeah. Amen. <clears throat> um, and uh, came out of that, uh, what, uh, Ended up at a church um, uh, of a good friend of mine, and I hope to one day bring him. He's just, he's been a, a very special friend, and he's been there for some of the hardest times of my life. Bishop Henry Fernandez, he's a, he has a church in Fort Lauderdale. He has a television ministry and just an awesome man of God. And, and uh, I remember ending up at his church, and I actually went because I'm like, who's this Spanish brother with this big church? You know, his name is Henry Fernandez, you know? So I'm walking up in this huge church. And, uh, and then I go in, and I said, Every, everyone's Afro-American. I was like, man, this, is, this, this guy's awesome, man. He's a Spanish guy, but he's got an Afro-American congregation. I said, that's incredible. And then he gets up, and he's Afro-American, you know? He just happened to way down the road. Somebody was Cuban, you know? That's literally what it is. Some, way down the road, somebody. <laughs> so he had that Fernandez last name. I says, man, I said, you're the darkest Spanish dude I've ever met, you know? <laughs> just, he's, he's awesome. I love him, you know? And uh, and uh, was there, he had a speaker come in one day, and a uh, uh, powerful woman of God, and she spoke a word, on, listen, listen to me, church, because this will help you. She spoke a word on Joseph, and I was, I was happy that this evangelist, that she came to minister there because of my wife. My wife really loved her. And I was happy my wife is receiving. I'm happy we're in the service and this woman's preaching and everything. And I'm, I, it was good, you know, I mean, but I was like, my wife's being blessed. She's happy. And all of a sudden she says, but Joseph, she says, they threw you in the pit. They thought you were dead. Man, I'm telling you, church, I bowed over. I mean, tears just began gushing, you know. He says, they meant it for evil. A God meant it for good, for the saving of many lives, for the saving of many lives. Can I get a little bit more in the house, just a little bit more in the house, Tina, please? They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I want to tell you, church, that that began my healing of what, of what happened at, in, in my first ministry. It began to heal me from the inside because I thought, like, I thought I forgave. You know how you think you forgive? But then somebody brings that person's name up, and you're just like, the, the cuss words are, are getting to about right here, but they don't come out. He's like, I'm not going to cuss, but they just come. Like, they just start here, and they, they just they go right about here. 
and you don't cuss, but you know you're thinking of all the cuss words, you know what I mean? You, th- you know what you're thinking about them, but they just don't, they don't exit, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes, so, sometimes, that's right, sometimes. And, um, and I began, you know, my healing process, and God really spoke to my wife and I to move over to that ministry, and we learned so much. I thank God for what we learned there, because uh, honestly, what we learned there is going to help us at New Dawn go to where God has, is taking us. Amen. 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 Um, you know, after a season, we ended up moving back to, to the Fort Lauderdale area. I got involved in, in business and in some different things, but always uh, involved in ministry. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, my pastor, my, my pastor right now, who uh, uh, He started this church in Boca. We moved back, and I said, listen, I'm going to be traveling, evangelizing, and everything. I said, so when I'm in town, I want you to be my pastor. And he said, okay. And he started telling me about a Spanish ministry that they started. I was like, well, that's cool. God bless you, because I don't, you know, I really, I don't really speak Spanish that well. So, you know, and what he was trying to do is hint that he wanted me to take the church. I was like, man, God didn't call me to, to preach in Spanish. I've never preached in Spanish in my life, you know. And uh, he brought it up two more times. And I was like, what's wrong with him, man? I just shared with him what my vision was. And he's telling me about this Spanish church. And uh, anyway, finally, after a little bit, I said, you know what? I told my wife, I said, we're not serving right now. We're not doing anything. We're not traveling like the way we thought we were going to try. I said, let's, let's help him with this church. Wow, I, f- I felt bad for those people with that first message. You know what I mean? Because it was like, it was all butchered up. It was Spanglish. It was like, it was all jacked up. I mean, it was just all, I mean, I, I think people were like, their faces were like in shock. I thought they saw an angel behind me. But it was just, they were just like, man, are you serious? Like, this is, you, you're trying to, t- you guys trying to preach to us and, you know, and I mean, I was saying all kinds of messed up stuff, you know, and accents and everything was wrong. And, but you know what, church? We, you know, we were there for five years. God sharpened our tools there, sharpened me and my wife, and, you know, to get us ready for the powerful journey that we have ahead here at New Dawn Christian Village, you know? And um, I believe that, amen? I believe that with all my heart. I believe all of that stuff was just meant to get us to a place, you know, and church, let me hear, let me just say this to you. For years, I thought like, I just was wondering, God, why won't, you, why won't you let me do the things that you showed me in my times of prayer? I know what you said, but how come I'm not walking in what you showed me? And it was just this one thing to another thing to another thing. And I want to tell you something. My wife will tell you this, and I know this is going on video, and this is not meant to offend anyone. Do you know that I am right now? happiest I've been in 14 years 2000 to 2014 listen you know why because I don't know if there's any golfers in 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 the place but you know the sweet spot that little spot where you hit and it just goes ting you know this is the sweet spot this church is the sweet spot hallelujah let me say something to you people This is the destiny of God for me and my wife here. It is God's plan. It is God's, you know what? And here's the funny thing. There was a a research committee that voted, you know, on who the pastor was going to be. But I will tell you this right now. When it all started, it's so funny. Here, I put my name to be the pastor. I know I shared this last night. I put my name, so some of you don't know. I I said, you know what? I came to speak in January. So I want to be, you know, I knew. God said, you're the man. All of a sudden, I put my name in. All these people from everywhere start putting their name in and everything like that. You know, you think you start sweating because I already told, I, I already, I put all my chips in the middle of the pot because I said, I told my pastor, I said, my time is up here. God spoke to me. So like, if this didn't come through, I had nothing. You know what I'm saying? But I said, I just knew. And I, I know I said it last week, T.D. Jakes could have put his name in. I said, this is my, this, this was, this, God called me here. Amen. God called me and my wife here. And we, we talk about with some of, the, some of the leaders here, we just say, why would God send from 2,600 miles from somewhere so far 
over here. Church, I don't know. But I do know that the vision that Pastor Frank Wilson and Sister Bunny Wilson had and have for this church is going to get accomplished. Amen? Amen? God sent me to complete a vision that a man of God had in his heart, things that he saw that you didn't see, things that why he put this church right here, why he chose this school, that he saw things that we didn't see. But there's a reason. And so what was his heart? Obviously, the word village. You know, we want a community of believers. What is going to be the greatest challenge of New Dawn Christian Village? That as we grow and explode to keep that part of the vision that Pastor Frank had, and that is to have a community of people. We need wisdom from the Lord to make sure that we keep that friendly family atmosphere, loving one another, but at the same time, be able to grow and expand. Amen? So I want to share with you a couple of things. Believe it or not, that's the beginning of my message, you know. <laughs> listen, I'm going to try to breeze through this. I know, listen, I just want you to know, I'm sorry, I don't care about the clock, so I'm just, you know, I'm sorry, you know, all right, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try, I'm going to try to hurry. I don't, I, I think I'm going to try to hurry. All right, Listen. Two times in prayer, this came to me. And I just want you to take note of it. Number one, uh, not number one, but just two times this came to me. I was praying about it, and I, I said this. We want to change our city and influence our world. Now, you say, what's so, what's so big deal about that? Because I've heard pastors say, we're going to change our city. We're going to change our world. What caught my attention is that two times without me being conscious, I declared over New Dawn Christian Village, we're going to change our city. We're going to influence our world. There's a difference. There's a difference between the two. We're going to change our city. But our, ch our church is going to be so powerful that it's going to influence. It's going to have a worldly influence. Come on now. I'll preach to myself if I have to, but I know I'm in agreement with me. I'm in agreement with what I heard. I am in agreement with myself. I am in agreement with Irwin. <laughs> Hopefully by the end, you'll be in agreement with me too. How are we going to do that? Psalms 133. A lot of you know this. Psalms 133 says this. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version, verses, of course, 1 to 3. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? In what? Unity. Unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Listen, for there the Lord commanded what? Come on, church. He commanded the blessing and life forevermore. Where there's unity, you can do everything when you're united. Everything is possible when you're in unity. Everything is possible. You go back to Genesis, the Tower of Babel. These people said, you know what? Let's build a place. Let's try to build some, a, a, a place to get to heaven. Well, they got united and they started. God said, ho, ho, hold up a minute. They're actually going to do this. Why? Because they had a spirit of unity. Everything is possible with unity. And God commands his blessing when we're in unity. Come on, church. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 to 12. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Listen to verse 12. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not what? Is not quickly or easily broken. You, the, two son, the two brothers right here, can you come up real quick for me? Come on, man. Don't Just do it for Pastor Irwin. I know we just met, but come over here. <laughs> come over here. I want to I wanna just show you an illustration. I'm going to have these two big young guys. Here, hold my hand over here. I don't know if you ever played that game when you were younger, like Red Rover, Red Rover, let, you know, 
Come on. Let Franco come over, you know. And what you do is you hold hands really strong, right? And they, they start running at full speed to see if they can break, break the chain. And most of the time, because they're running full speed, you know, it breaks. But let me tell you something. Here, hook my arm like this. Come here. Now, I'll tell you what. We've played this, too, when, when people have been like this. You know, I'm talking about with the boys, you know. We, we started hooking arms. Let me tell you something. You're not going to break that. You're not going to break that. When you hook arms and you, you locked up together, he's locked up with me and we locked up together. Let me tell you something. We're not going to break that. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Give him a hand. <laughs> Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Listen, I, you know, I, I will tell you this. Trust me. You know how people try to front and they say, that, oh, yeah, I was in a gang and this and that. Listen, I was in a gang by default. I just hung out with them. I didn't want to, all I wanted to do was go to the club and get it on. I did not want to fight nobody. We would be going to the club and 10, listen, I'm not exaggerating, 10 car loads, eight car loads. We would all be driving together. We all went to the club at the same time. And all these guys are like, yeah, yeah, don't look at us mean. And I didn't care about all that. I just went to the DJ. I said, listen, I need you to play this song, you know? <laughs> okay. I said, man, t- this is what I want, you know? And everything. Me and my friend, we used to love, man, go to, and everything. So these guys, you know, so I was, you know, I was, I was in a gang. I used to throw up gang signs. Now, I wasn't nothing like Lathan. Lathan's from the real part, like the real gang, real gang land. Come on now. You know, he's from, you know, Compton and everything, you know, all these different places. That, you know, I was a fake gang person, you know? You know, I mean, I just, I just wanted to dance. That's all, man. I said, like, you, go, you guys go fight. I'll, I'll go dance with your girlfriend, you know? So... Yes, he said that. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that's my mentality. So, so, you know what? The truth is, is that I believe in that unity. I believe that we're supposed to be together. I believe that in that mindset that, you know what? Hey, if you're in my gang, then we, we, we're together. And nobody's going to mess with you and nobody's going to mess with me. You know, three weeks ago, this is only three weeks ago. This is a God's honest truth story. I'm at, uh, uh, we, we went to go play basketball with a, with a bunch of my friends, so their little kids come. So we, you know, my team won, and I just had to clarify that. My team won, so we, you know, you stay on the court if you win. So uh, uh, my kids in my church, you know, they're like ages about 10 to 13. They said, Pastor Irwin, Pastor Irwin, they're not letting us play. They're not letting us play. You're supposed to, whoever, you know, if you win, you stay on. And we, we have a team. I said, listen, come on, you guys. And all the big guys, all the adults are like, no, come on. If we're going to play, let's play for real, you know. I says, no, 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 hold up, you know. We won. You guys lost, so sit down. And so my little kids, I said, listen, how about take a break? Listen, so me and my kids, six, six of my middle schoolers, not even middle school, elementary age, so 10 to 13 around there, you know, that, that the oldest one was 13, the youngest one was 10, six of them. I said, you know what? I said, let's play around the world. So we start playing around the world. Six kids and me on, on playing, you know, playing around the world. So we start going around, start going around, and this big kid comes, and he go, comes from half court and takes a shot. And it almost hits one of my kids. I, says, I said, hey, man. I said, what are you doing? I said, we're playing a game right here. And he goes, it's a public court. Man, I said, all right. It's a public, it's, it's a public, it's a public court. I just said, I said, I said, I mean, part of me was, I, I said, I, that's the wrong, I mean, you know, that's the wrong thing to say with an attitude, you know. So, you know. I believe in respect, you know, this guy, I said, I said, I said, all right. So, you know, but the whole thing, it wasn't about me being whatever. It's about, I mean, he almost hit my kids. So I walked over to him and I said, listen, man, I said, you want to shoot? You better not hit my kids. Don't hit my kids. And my kids are sitting there watching me, you know, talk to them. And so I said, oh man, Pastor Owen, he's upset, you know. I said, yeah, I'm upset. Don't hit my kids. And that's the same thing with us, man. That's the same thing with all of us. In the spirit, as much as we can, we're, gonna, we're not going to let the devil hit you. We're going to cover you. We're going to protect you. Amen? Come on now. That's good. 
<clears throat> Last week we talked about God's plan to touch the earth and change the earth is, um, is you. Um, I, I'm not going to get into it, but, you know, David's mighty men, if you study that, you know, David had this group of guys, these misfits that were around him, but because he was a warrior, he changed them into warriors. How about Jesus, when he was going around, he says, hey, Matthew, why don't you stop collecting taxes and come and, and follow me? Hey, Peter, James, John, why don't you guys stop fishing? And he goes, I'll make you fishers of men. You follow what I'm saying? He, you know, he just said, come follow me. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. That's the type of spirit that we need, you know, in the church. I want to ask you this question, church. At the end of the day, come on, I want you to think with me for a moment. This may be like so deep, but I really want you to think about New Dawn Church, New Dawn Christian Village. At the end of the day, let's just say five years from now, we're in a huge building. Thousands of people television ministry. Is that, is that what it's about? Money in the bank? L -l -l hear what I'm saying, church. Is that who we are? Is that, is that what, what we're about? I want you to think for a moment. Because some of us are screaming, heck yeah. Inside. Yes, we want all those things. Are any of those things bad or wrong? None of them are. But at the end of the day, what I just got to ask you this. What's it all about? Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. A lot of you guys know this story. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village. Hallelujah. I want to be that certain village. And a certain woman named Martha, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing, one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. The one thing, she sat at his feet. And I will tell you this, if we have all that other stuff, but we don't have the one thing, and that is his presence. If we have all of that and we don't have his presence, we have nothing. We have nothing. And I will tell you this, I am not jealous or, or about any, what anybody else has. I want what God has for us. I don't care who's got what. What does God have for us? And it all starts with his presence. It all starts with prayer. It all starts with seeking his face. I'd rather have 10 people but have him than have 10,000 people, but I don't. all I have is a show. All I have is, listen, how much in the church, listen to me, New Dawn, how much of the things in the church do we really need God? Put a, a guy up here with a personality and knows how to speak? Put some musicians up there that know how to play? Do you need God for that? Someone with a pretty voice? You don't need God for that. You can have your own little club show and, and all that stuff, but I will tell you this. But if you want his presence, you got to fight for it. You got to seek it out. You got to pray. You got to call upon God and get before him and weep and cry and be desperate People want an encounter with God. Church, let me say this to you. People want to know God. And what are we doing in our church, whether you're a greeter, whether you're an usher, whether you're a singer, whether you play an instrument, whether you're the preacher, what are you doing 
to, ha- to cause people to have that encounter with God? Are you an extension of his hand? Are you an extension of his heart? Or are you just going through the motions? Listen, this is all a self-evaluation for all of us. What are you a member of? What are you a member of? I just want to tell you this, church. If we're going to be team members and we're going to work together and we're going to seek the Lord, I want it to be because we're seeking his presence. I will say this to you. I will resign and do something else if we're not going to seek his face. If we're going to have all the other, if you told me right now that in five years from now we would have all the other things but not have him, I would say it's time for somebody else. Because he has to be the goal. If he's the goal, the people will know it. If he's the goal, the people will come. If he is the goal, the people will know that you are genuine in what you're doing. Hallelujah. He has got to be the goal. Jesus has to be the goal. In everything that we do, Jesus must be the goal. Don't make getting out of here a goal. Make Jesus the goal. If Jesus is the goal, people will come running to this altar. Because they will know. They will feel. They will have that encounter with God. Come on now. Jesus has to be the goal. Serving is good. Thank God for the Marthas. But all of us can have that Martha spirit, but with the heart of Mary. So I just, I may be setting this up, but as I'm setting this up, as I'm setting that camera up, and as I'm adjusting that sound knob, and as I'm playing that instrument inside every fiber of my being, all I'm saying is I I just want him. It's amazing to me, especially with music, how you can listen to someone and you can hear someone sing a song, but there's nothing behind it. There's no, there's no, there's nothing behind it. And then you can hear someone sing a song, a distinct person from a distinct city or a certain city. And when they sing, whew, the presence of God comes. My goal and my job is actually very easy because I don't have to impress you. I just have to impress him. That's it. If I impress him, if I do what he says, I've done my job. If I've been with him, I've done my job. It's all about him. And I want to say this to you. Some of you that have been serving the Lord for, for, for a long period of time, check your heart. Are you just doing what you've always known to do? Yeah, my mama raised us in church. I've been raised in church. I've done church my whole life. This is what I do on Sundays. Check your heart. That's not bad. But what is your motive of what you're doing? I pray that God reveals himself to you deeper and greater. That you would know that the reason for everything we do is that we may encounter him. So next Sunday when we come in here, that you would be mindful that we are here to encounter God. And that may come with a handshake, and that may come with a hug, and that may come with a song, and that may come with the sermon, that may come with different things. But the one thing is the goal, the one thing, Mary, 
to sit at his feet, to know him. Hallelujah. Let's all stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your presence, God, is heaven to us, God. Your presence is heaven to us, Lord. I just want you to take time and renew your heart for a moment. I just want you to just evaluate yourself and say, why do I do what I do? Why am I here? What am I doing? And I want to challenge you to be a part of a winning team. I want to challenge you to be a part of something that is going to change this city and is going to influence our world. I want you to look inside your heart and say, can I attach myself to that? Can I attach myself to what he said? And if you can, God is speaking to you today and he's calling you today to team up with us in a moment if your heart was stirred and maybe you are not a member of our church maybe you you have never established membership here i will tell you this after this message and not because i preach it i would want to be a part of what god is doing here i would want to be a part and if you have not made that commitment in a moment, I'm going to make a call. And I just want you to boldly get out of your seat and come forward and stand here. But there's another group of people that I want to talk to and speak to. And I want to tell you that if you're here and you don't know Jesus or you're away from him and you've been away from him and you just know that your relationship is not close. You know you got stuff in your life and you need God to cleanse you and purify you and you want him. You want to have that spirit of Mary that says I want to sit at his feet. I want Jesus to forgive me for my sins and I want to establish that strong relationship with him God is speaking to you too God is speaking to you today so as we worship right now and we are in his presence I want to challenge you Christian challenge you, loved one, challenge you, my friend, that you would answer the call. Answer the call and say yes. Say yes. Say yes to him. Your presence, God, is heaven to us. As we